If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus saying such a thing as that to us at such a moment like this feels a little, shall we say, tone deaf. I mean, read the room, Jesus. Deny ourselves? What more can be taken from us? We have literally gone without the ability to hug those in our extended family, to eat dinner with friends, to participate in any form of embodied relationship with anyone outside our own homes for almost a whole year now. Then if that wasn't enough, then we lost power and heat and water. We lost regular church, and then we lost outdoor church, and then last week we couldn't even access Zoom church. Take up our cross? Haven't we suffered enough in this last year? Half a million Americans now dead from a virus? That's more than the American lives lost in World War I, II, and Vietnam combined. And then millions more dead from all the other more normal causes, and not one of them have been rightfully mourned or given the funerals that they deserve. Not to mention all the increased psycho-emotional strain we're all carrying around with us every day, all of us struggling to remain hopeful in continued isolation, trying to just stay afloat, swimming against currents of depression, anxiety, and fear. I don't know about you, but I have been denied enough lately. I've had enough of taking up my cross. Thank you very much, Jesus. But still, Jesus' words stare back at us with the stubbornness of an immovable mountain, like the rude classmate who is not listening to what you're saying, but instead you can tell is just counting down the seconds until you stop talking because they already know what they're going to say in return. Jesus simply repeats, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. What are we to do with difficult words such as these in a difficult moment such as this? There's two things I suggest we can take away from such words in this moment. The first one is a hard truth we must work to accept, and the second is a source of comfort. So first, remember, this is the hard one. Suffering is an unavoidable aspect of the Christian experience. It just is. Plain and simple, to follow Jesus is to suffer. It is to bear burdens, to bear a cross. And this is true in at least two senses, one general and one specific. First, the specific. Following Jesus will inevitably have consequences on the shape of your life that will over time make you less likable to society at large. There are specific ways in which you become unlikable when you become a Christian. That is, the more that you follow Jesus, the more you will, for example, begin to speak up on behalf of those that most of society has tried to push to the edges of their minds by pushing to the edges of their cities. You will, for example, insist on the reality of transcendence in a world that has tried its hardest to flatten every kind of meaning down to two dimensions. You will insist on peace and nonviolence in a world that prefers coercion and war. You will insist on justice for those wronged and forgiveness for those who did the wrong in the first place. Believe me, you will suffer for these things. The Roman occupied world of Jesus may appear to be a lot different than the world of 21st century America that we live in, but at least in these respects, the world has not changed nearly as much as many people think. To follow Jesus is to have one's life changed in ways that before long are viewed as a threat to the prevailing order of things. To follow Jesus is to be mocked as he was mocked and sometimes even killed as he was killed. 
If we never find ourselves being a thorn in the side of society, we should probably ask ourselves if we really are following Jesus after all. But to be a follower of Jesus means to suffer not just in this specific sense, but in a general sense too. What I mean is actually, suffering seems to be an unavoidable aspect of not just the Christian experience, but of the human experience. Who makes it through this life without suffering? Sure, the suffering is not evenly distributed, but as Mother Mary said last week, nobody wins in a contest of competitive suffering. I've yet to meet someone who truly has it easy, despite the fact that many profess to have had it precisely so. In the words of revered legends of American rock, R.E.M., everybody hurts. So, sometimes Christians suffer because they are Christians, sometimes they suffer just because they're human. But the essential difference is this. The essential difference when it comes to suffering between Christians and the world that Jesus' words in this gospel passage help us realize is that Christians are not surprised by suffering when it arrives, or at least they ought not to be. Christians are not surprised by suffering when it arrives, and furthermore, because Christians expect suffering, they do not then lead their lives trying to avoid it at all costs, or at least they shouldn't. This I think is what Jesus is trying to say. It is, of course, the most natural thing in the world to avoid suffering at all costs. Most of the world lives this way. Most of us live this way most of the time. Who likes being uncomfortable? Who likes being mocked? But when Christians come up against suffering, what I'm trying to say is that avoiding it is simply not their top priority. It shouldn't be their top priority, being a follower of Jesus is our top priority. Being a witness to the gospel is our top priority. And we find that occasionally buying the ticket out of suffering would require us to sacrifice our own witness to to Jesus. And so when those opportunities arise, when those two things come into conflict, one simply chooses to keep following Jesus and to stay in the suffering. That is the Christian path. If they can avoid suffering and still be a follower of Jesus, all the better. Jesus isn't telling people to throw themselves on the funeral pyre. If you are cold and someone is offering you a warm place to stay, as what happened to us last week, by all means, take them up on it. But the reason Christians are able to make this choice, this insane choice to occasionally remain in their suffering, is that the life of Jesus has taught them to expect that the suffering of the cross leads to resurrection. That is, suffering, though not to be sought out for its own sake, can itself be a source of renewal. We as Christians actually expect suffering to lead to new life. That's what the whole story of Jesus teaches us. It trains our expectations differently when it comes to suffering. It does not make suffering any easier, of course. Suffering is still suffering, but this alters our orientation towards it. Suffering is not then to be seen as a temporary interruption to one's life of discipleship. As if I'm following Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus, but things are a little crazy right now, so that's on hold, and then when things return to normal, I'll be a follower of Jesus again. Suffering is the primary avenue on which the car of discipleship is meant to drive. Suffering is its primary context. This has been an extraordinarily difficult year, and yes, We do hope and I firmly believe that things will return to some kind of normal sometime later this year. But I also know that even in that back to normal state, you and I will continue to suffer. All I'm saying now is don't be surprised by that. And don't now just wait for all the suffering to be over, but instead consider the cross that you are bearing and then be so bold as to expect resurrection to come out the other side. Look in the face at what is bad and be so bold as to expect something beautiful to emerge from it. That is the upside down shape 
of Christianity. Now on to the second thing. This is the hopeful one. The second thing only came to me as I was reflecting on our artwork that we now have hanging in the nave. I've been particularly struck by Ruo's image of the assistant carrying the cross. Remember, as Jesus journeyed from his sentencing outside, as he journeyed from his sentencing outside the city gates to the hilltop of his execution, he struggled to keep his cross aloft. Remember, eventually Jesus needed help. A man named Simon from Cyrene helped Jesus carry the cross. So here's the second thing then. You don't have to carry your cross alone. And I mean that not in the usual sentimental sounding, Jesus is always with you, Jesus can help you kind of way. In this case, it's actually Jesus who needed the help. And this moment unlocks for us a very important theological insight. Jesus, the Son of God, fully human and fully divine, who lived perfectly without sin, asked for help. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus was perfect, but Jesus was too weak to continue. Those are two things that are both true at the same time. Jesus was perfect and Jesus needed help, meaning Jesus' weakness. Indeed, Jesus asking for help, for help is not evidence of his imperfection, but precisely the opposite. Weakness is not the opposite of perfection. Independence is not a feature of sinlessness. Actually, it turns out that needing others is itself part of being truly and perfectly human. That's what we see when Simon of Cyrene takes up the cross for Jesus. We are not made to be alone. God saw that it was not good for one human to dwell alone in the Garden of Eden. Jesus traveled and spread the gospel not alone, but with 12 companions. And after those disciples, and after those disciples, after Jesus' death, they were sent out not alone, but two by two. And then those paired up disciples traveled the ancient world, not saving individual souls, but establishing communities of interdependent disciples called churches. We are not made to be alone. And more importantly, we are not meant to bear our burdens alone. We naturally need help carrying our crosses. We're meant to have help. We are indeed more fully human, more perfect, when we are living into the mutual interdependence of the body of Christ. If Jesus can ask for help, so can you. What I said to you in my sermon two weeks ago remains heavy on my heart today. Everyone I know is hurting right now. And Jesus is saying two things to those of us who are hurting. On the one hand, he can't promise that the suffering we are enduring is going to go away. But on the other, he can promise us that we don't have to suffer alone. Let me say this to you as your pastor. Do not be afraid to ask for help. It's not easy to ask for help, I know. But one of the gifts of a worldwide crisis is that it's never been more socially acceptable to admit that you are struggling. <laughs> Your struggles will not be a surprise to anyone. So find people, reach out to people. I know many of our accustomed avenues of relationship are cut off right now, but there is still lots that we can do. Reach out to us, your pastors. You can come sit in our front yards or visit with us over the phone. Let us pray for and with you. Find a therapist. It's one of the bedrock beliefs of my life that every single person in the world should be in therapy. I am in therapy. Go to therapy. It's a good idea. <laughs> Reach out to friends. Be so bold as to reconnect with old ones you haven't talked to in years. Now is the perfect time. 
Many of you have been doing things like this already. Jim Clark has his own once a week driveway breakfast club that he hosts. Many of you I see are walking the streets of Barton Hills and beyond with your friends in the early mornings and the early evenings. Just this last week, practically overnight, the, our men's group organized their own rotation of folks to go and sit socially distanced with our brother Rex White to keep him company twice a day. Many of you did this during the storm last week. We asked for help, me and Anna and Lori. We asked for help and we were shuttled by one friend with four-wheel drive to the Bushman's house who literally gave us food and shelter. Asking for help, remember, is not a sign of weakness, but of strength. Indeed, of perfect holiness. It is what Jesus did. Do not be afraid. There is no moment of opportunity like today. Our bishop, Bishop Doyle, he often uses this particular benediction that's not in the prayer book uh, that he borrowed from another bishop somewhere else. Um, he often uses this benediction when he visits congregations across the diocese, and it's just been ringing in my head um, this week, and it feels particularly appropriate today. So I'm going to leave you with this and end the sermon with this benediction. This is what Bishop Doyle says. He says, do not pray for easy lives, but pray instead to be stronger people for the living of life. Do not pray for tasks that are equal to your gifts and talents and treasure, but instead pray for the gifts and talents and treasure to meet the tasks that are in front of you. For in that way, when anything is finished, any mission undertaken, any ministry accomplished, it will not be the miracle, but instead you will be the miracle. And every day you shall wonder at the mercy, love, grace, and power that has come from God through you into the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you. Amen.